Good afternoon and welcome once again to Digital Look TV. Joining us today is Craig Erlam. He is market analyst at Alpari UK. Craig, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay. This morning, everybody was saying that we had an agreement in the United States on Capitol Hill, but that the US government was really only kicking the can down the road. Because of that, people were saying that Fed tapering was off the table. That's good for equity markets, but if Fed tapering needs to continue, perhaps that isn't so good. Perhaps towards the spring, we would end up having problems again. But as you were telling me just a moment before, when we were speaking uh, before the interview, if something has really shown through from or come out of this entire debt impasse or fiscal impasse in the United States, it is that the Republican Party is weak. Uh, please explain this to the viewers. To what extent do you concur? What are the implications? Well, I think that's one thing that's certainly come from this. Um, when we were talking about all these negotiations, they were mm -hmm. insistent that they wanted the Obamacare to be repealed. Uh, up until about a week ago, there was no, nego no negotiations on this. But as the week went by, the Democrats weren't backing down and the Republicans were forced to. I don't really think they had any alternative. It's not essentially weakness because they want to show weakness. It's weakness because they had no other alternative. They, they, don't, have, uh, they don't have that majority in the Senate. Um, they don't have a Republican uh, president. Uh, and I think they, because the thing they were trying to essentially repeal has been voted in democratically, exactly. as, much as, even, as much as they can argue how that was passed through, um, it was upheld in the Supreme Court, uh, and then the voters voted back in a Democratic president. Hmm. Um, I don't really think they had uh, too much really backing them. I think they had to eventually back down. I think it was never going to be a case of whether the Rep Republicans would successfully repeal Obamacare. Mm -hmm. it, was a case, it was always going to be a case of what concessions the Democrats offered, uh, offered the Republicans in order to get them to agree on a deal. And it, as it turned out, it didn't actually take too, uh, too much in the form of concessions. So I think certainly the Republicans have come off this week, uh, or essentially much weaker. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a market's perspective and from uh, a general economic perspective, it was quite encouraging to see this, kind of, this weakness from the Republicans because it suggests that any, uh, any negotiations further down the road or in this case it's three, four months down the road, it suggests that there's no real threat uh, of the US hitting the debt ceiling and defaulting on its debts because we know that eventually the Republicans will back down and take some small concessions along the way uh, mm -hmm. and broker a deal. Okay, that's a, that is an extremely powerful insight. It might be perhaps one of the reasons why equity markets really weren't that scared in the run-up to this entire fiasco on Capitol Hill and perhaps also why the S&P is rising this afternoon, you believe? Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's tr completely correct. I mean, in a couple of weeks before, I mean, I think I was actually a little bit surprised as to how mm -hmm. little uh, equity markets were selling off. In the few weeks before, there was so much uncertainty in the markets, it wasn't really surprising to see markets really grinding low and mm -hmm. not really making any substantial losses. But I thought at least in the days leading up to the deal when no, no deal was being agreed, we were still seeing them grinding low. We weren't seeing any uh, significant losses. And that suggests that people just aren't, weren't convinced that, it, that people were convinced that a deal was going to be done and eventually that the Republicans uh, would back down. So I think that's why we didn't see uh, too much reaction there, which again is a positive thing going forward. Uh, the only real area which we actually saw any kind of reaction in the markets was uh, short-term treasuries uh, of around one, mm. one to three months in maturity, right. uh, simply because people well, investors were taking precautions. They may not have been convinced that we were necessarily going to see uh, the U.S. default on its debt, but the the treasuries most at risk were those shorter term treasuries, which were maturing within the two or three weeks following any deal that may not have come to fruition. So mm -hmm. that was the only real area that we saw any reaction in the market. So going forward, it's extremely encouraging because it suggests that people aren't necessarily as uh, shocked by the, and awed by this anymore. And mm -hmm. it suggests that going down the road, we may still have that uncertainty again uh, come February the 7th when the, uh, the US is next due to hit the debt ceiling, uh, but at least we're not going to see so much negativity similar to what we saw in 2011. Okay, fantastic. Um, Fed tapering. Um, again, coming going into the session this morning, Fed tapering was off the table. Most people seem to be thinking along those lines. Given these reflections, what, where do you stand at the moment? Where do you see Fed tapering going? 
Uh, I think it's, they, they, they can't possibly taper this year now. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I've, I've said for a number of months now it was going to be December at the earliest, Indeed. probably the first quarter of 2014. Mm -hmm. If anything, now I'm, I'm, I'm more dovish. I think it's going to be the first quarter of 2014 and potentially late on in the quarter, okay. uh, simply because the US government hasn't uh, got rid of these risks, which were essentially delaying any form of tapering. The hmm. Fed couldn't possibly have tapered in September when we had a potential for a government shutdown, which did actually mm -hmm. materialise, mm -hmm. when we had the potential for the US to default on its debt. Uh, but, and now the fact that we can potentially have another government shutdown from January the 15th onwards, we could potentially, albeit unlikely, uh, see a uh, US default on its debt on February the 7th. I don't see how the Fed can possibly consider tapering mm -hmm. before then when there's so many risks to the economy. They are uh, acting as a key support for the economy right now and if they start to withdraw its support at a time when uh, government is offering little in the way of support themselves I think that'd be entirely irresponsible and I think that's going to play into the hands of those who want to see this 85 billion dollars a month of stimulus continue at least for the next six months or so. Okay, um, enter the scene Janet Yellen, new FOMC chairwoman. Um, is that a factor in the timing of the possible start to Fed tapering or uh not? Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Janet Yellen is known to be more dovish than Ben Bernanke himself, so I think that's got to essentially play a part. If it was, say, Larry Summers mm -hmm. who was going to be appointed as uh, Fed chairman, that may have made a difference. We know that Larry Summers was much more hawkish than both Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, so I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that mm -hmm. uh, markets were concerned about over the last couple of months. But now that it looks like it's going to be Janet Yellen that takes over at the end of January. I think that's certainly got to play into it as well. She is going to have more of a voice now on the uh, FOMC, hmm. clearly before she was the vice chairwoman, so she clearly had a voice then. But now that we know that she's probably going to be uh, the chairwoman, I think that's got to play into it. And again, that's just another reason why I don't see tapering now, probably until March. Okay. Let's cover some of the different asset classes. Uh, one of your favorite, favorite arenas or playgrounds, FX. Forex, uh, foreign exchange markets. The euro dollar. Everybody has been saying for the last couple of months, euro dollar down towards 130. Quite the opposite. Today was at 136.60 more or less when we stepped here, stepped inside this room. Um, do you see it going above 137, 140? Why? Why not? How do you see the situation? Well, we actually did see, it was quite surprising today, the fact that we've seen so much weakness in the dollar in the lead up to these mm -hmm. debt ceiling talks. 1% drop in the dollar index. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the fact that we've seen so much weakness in the dollar, um, it, it suggested that if we did see a resolution, we may at least in the short term see some form of dollar strength. But we've actually seen quite the opposite. And logically speaking, maybe we should have seen maybe a short term uh, respite in this, mm -hmm. in this climb higher in the euro dollar uh, just purely but off the reaction of this mm -hmm. uh, debt ceiling resolution or short term resolution mm -hmm. um, but then again if you look at all the rest of the markets a resolution was priced in so maybe maybe that's the argument against any form of respite in this uh, move higher um, but going forward now that we know that the fed tapering is likely to be delayed, to be delayed even further as a result mm -hmm. of this uh, all this all these issues on Capitol Hill, yes. then it's no surprise to see further weakness in the dollar. So yeah, I think absolutely, now that we're not looking at tapering in September or December, potentially probably later on in the first quarter of next year, then further dollar weakness is completely logical. Mm -hmm. um, as a, When we're talking about where it can go, I think 137 is the next clear uh, major resistance point. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't seen euro dollar trading above 137.10, I think it is for quite a while now. Uh, above here, I think I can't see it going above 140 at this stage. That's a huge resistance level. Why not? Um, technically speaking, there's a big there's a big resistance around that level. So, uh, firstly, I think technically speaking, I think 140 is massive. But mm -hmm. also, we've heard from the ECB who have claimed themselves that yeah. euro uh, strength, your, well, essentially your euro weakness, as it were, is mm. important for the eurozone. It is important for the recovery. Um, so I think as it approaches that 140 level, I think the, the ECB are going to be forced to intervene and weaken the currency, either through uh, another rate cut, which for me looks a little bit unlikely at this stage, based on the fact that the minutes, that not the minutes, that the uh, at the press conference, uh, Mario Draghi claimed that uh, a number of Fed, a number of uh, ECB policymakers didn't even want to discuss a rate cut at this stage. Hmm. Uh, only a few policymakers actually wanted to discuss a rate cut. I think we'd either have to see a rate cut, which like I say is unlikely, or potentially uh, another LTRO, which mm -hmm. would help to uh, shore up the uh, bank's balance sheets in the Eurozone and could potentially help lending throughout the region. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
again, given your macro view, which is uh, frankly quite, uh, I wouldn't say original, which it is, um, but unique. It's the first time I've heard this whole theme of uh, Republican weakness and its implications for capital markets in general. Gold, a lot of people, again, last couple of months, gold is gonna fall. Some people citing possible technical targets towards $1,100 per ounce. You don't concur with that view. Why, where do you see it going? Well, I think at least in the short term, again, it's all to do with the Federal Reserve, just like the, the price action mm -hmm. in gold has had been majorly impacted by what the Federal Reserve is doing. So I think this more bearish view on gold has been hugely driven uh, by, the, by what ben, ben Bernanke said back in May, okay. uh, by the fact that people fact, uh, priced in tapering in September, they were mm -hmm. wrong. The fact that people then may, may be looking towards December and they'll probably be wrong again. Um, the fact that people are now looking towards the end of the first quarter uh, suggests that that's got to be bullish for gold. Gold is seen as a hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. So the longer that <clears throat> the longer that the Fed looks to continue with its uh, asset purchase program in its current form, is going to be bullish for gold. Uh, on a technical standpoint, we've just seen it break through a major resistance level today. We've seen a significant rally in gold today off the back of this uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now back above 1300. So it wouldn't surprise me to to see it breach 1400, 1450 in the next few weeks. I think around that level, it's going to find it tough to break above. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least in the next three to six months, I can't really see, uh, I don't, well, in the next, next three months, let's say, I don't really see too much of a bearish outlook for gold. In the longer term, absolutely. I think in the next 12 to 18 months, we are going to be looking back towards that 1150 area. Mm -hmm. I think the previous lows were 1180. Uh, we've got to be looking now towards, in the longer term, towards 1150, and maybe mm -hmm. even the next 18 months to two years back towards 1,000 once the global economy settled down and people are focusing less on what the central banks are doing and more on what the economy is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, however, uh, one small detail. Before you were explaining to me that this is your outlook, but also the way that you see gold performing over the, the very short term is a slow grind higher mm -hmm. and capped for certain reasons. If you could perhaps add a little bit of color there. That has to do with what the Fed, what the Fed might do, how it might do it. Am I more or less right? Well, I think I think uh, absolutely. I think we will see. We've seen a quite a bullish move today, and I think that's maybe partly a little bit of an overreaction. Mm -hmm. I think. The fact that investors are going to be quite bearish on gold in the longer term hmm. is going to make people reluctant to get too bullish right now, which is why I think these moves higher probably are going to be capped at around 1450. Hmm. We've seen a big reaction today off the back of this resolution, which is never a surprise. Mm -hmm. We'll see, probably see a pullback now straight away okay. tomorrow. Uh, not necessarily a huge pullback, but a, pump, a pullback, some form of correction. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I do yeah, maybe see it just grinding higher, people remaining quite bullish, but being fully aware that in the next 12 months, it's going to look a lot more bearish. Again, purely based off what the Federal Reserve is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Um, one last asset class, commodities, oil. Um, a lot of observers have been talking in the last couple of days, or certainly quite a few, about the possible resolution of the, of the whole Iran issue. Um, were that to be resolved, sanctions lifted, oil production would tend to increase, markets would start to factor that in, oil price would start to uh, fall slowly, more quickly, depends on many factors. You can see it fall below $100. What's your opinion? Well, I think first, I think the first thing we've got to realize is that no, this re resolution mm -hmm. between the U.S. and Iran isn't going to be a quick fix. Mm -hmm. This is going to probably drag out over the next, well, maybe year, two years uh, mm -hmm. before we see any kind of agreement here. I still think they're pretty far apart on what they believe needs to be done next. I mean, this is a long-standing debate that we've, the, the U.S., the tensions between the U.S. and Iran has been going on for years. So the fact that people somehow believe that we're going to see a quick fix to this, I think we, we need to be a little bit more realistic here and mm. think this is going to be a longer-term fix. Uh, but I think the more, the more, the the better these negotiations go, it has to be more bearish on oil, uh, where it's going to fall to and how far it can go. I don't see it falling dramatically below $100. Uh, because? Simply because, uh, well, if we take a look at the last couple of years in particular, mm -hmm. the Saudis have essentially, uh, the, the, the lack of supply as a result of these sanctions on Iran, the Saudis have essentially made up for it by increasing their oil supply and that has helped to drive down the price. The Saudis uh, recently, well, over the last year, said that $100 a barrel <coughs> was mm -hmm. a fair price for oil. 
Um, so if the price of oil started to drop below $100, I see no reason why the Saudis wouldn't start to withdraw their supply slightly and try and keep that price around, around that $100 level. I think it could potentially drop to around 95 but once it started mm -hmm. to reach that level, I think we would see uh, the supply side start to be reduced uh, from the Saudis, which would push it back up towards that uh, fair price, as they say, of around $100 a barrel. Okay, magic. Thank you very much. Craig, fortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, it was extremely interesting and we do hope you will join us again next week. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And that's all from all of us here at Digital Look TV. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Until next week.